Hello, thank you for your patience. Uh, good evening and welcome to the, the Yazdowski Castle Centre for Contemporary Art. It's a great pleasure to be here again for our fifth edition of uh, our series of discussions called Culture Tensions, um, which has been curated by myself and my colleague Agnieszka Kolek. Um, so tonight's discussion, I think, is, um, as with all of our debates, um, is entirely relevant to the current socio and cultural politics of our times. We're going to be talking about art and identity politics. And, um, you know, how, how relevant that is, is, um, is uh, feels so important. Um, obviously, I can speak about what's going on in the United Kingdom, in, uh, in the UK. Um, so only this week, for example, um, we had, um, there's been party conferences going on. So the Labour Party, um, the opposition party, had, to, had its conference, um, which just recently finished. And uh, a, a member of parliament um, uh, from, of the Labour Party, uh, elected uh, representative um, of South Asian descent, uh, her name Rupa Huck, uh, was suspended uh, this week by her own party because of a racist comment she made uh, at a conference fringe event about uh, our new, um, or the new Conservative Chancellor of the Exchequer, um, whose name is um, Kwasi, uh, Mr. Kwasi Kartang, or Kwartang. And um, she said about him, uh, he's of, um, by the way, he's of Ghanaian, West African origin, um, but he was born in the United Kingdom. And um, she said um, when commenting on his current um, uh, budget that he is superficially a black man. Uh, and added that if people listen to Mr. Kwartang's uh, uh, radio interviews, they wouldn't know that he's black. In other words, he's only black by skin, by his culture, not by his upbringing, not by the way he speaks educational background. So it feels that identity politics is um, it's constantly being um, brought to the foreground um, while other pressing matters on the economy, the war in Ukraine um, are backgrounded. Um, and we want to kind of really try and pick out why, why this is going on. Um, you know, another recent example, the, 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 the brilliant novelist Salman Rushdie, who was horribly attacked by a person of a Muslim background. Um, that he's not necessarily a Muslim, therefore he's an apostate. Um, he doesn't wear the Muslim identity. So these are very two very recent examples of um, uh, people where... Uh, you know, eminent individuals who are criticized for not being black enough or not being Muslim, um, and therefore um, open to attack by other people from those communities. Um, it feels that society is clamping down on freedom of expression for fear of offending minority identity groups. And the uh, the moral crime of uh, asserting your biology, your, your, your human physical body that you're born in, that you're a woman or a man, that if you say a woman is a woman, it is almost like heresy in your eyes. So that's just my kind of preliminary introduction um, uh, to, to tonight's debate. Uh, we have three wonderful um, speakers, um, and I'm going to introduce you very briefly. Um, um, if you do want to find out more about them, there is um, uh, the, the biographies on the um, uh, castle website. Um, so in order of um, speaking, um, we're going to have um, my colleague, Agnieszka Kolleg. So as well as being a curator and uh, co-founder of the Passion for Freedom Arts Festival, uh, which uh, happened in London uh, up until 2014 or 15. 2018. Yes, in 2019. Um, so the Passion for Freedom Festival, which uh, Agnieszka was uh, uh, co-founded, um, supports artists who are usually forbidden to exhibit their art. Um, the artist that exposes the silence of, many, of the many and challenges the comfortable positions of those who inhabit safe spaces. Uh, Agnieszka bravely survived the terror attack in Copenhagen back in 2015. And uh, she continued 
the public meeting that she had there, um, because um, um, the, you know, if, if to silence her would would have been a, uh, acceptance of um, of that th these terrorists um, have won. So she actually carried on the meeting, saying, "If they want to kill us, um, they, 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 they'll have to try and stop us talking. Not let us continue." So um, that's uh, a powerful um, uh, spirit to to hold, and I think we should all find that spirit. Second will be our uh, guest, uh, our first of our guest, uh, Rosie Kay. Delighted and honoured to have you here. Um, Rosie is. Uh, a, a brilliant dancer and choreographer. Um, born in Scotland, and she danced from a very early age. Trained at the London Contemporary Dance School, um, but also um, uh, was, you know, had a career as a dancer and has performed in Poland and has Poland, uh, Polish roots, actually, um, as well as many other European countries, France and Germany, as well as the USA. Um, so she returned back to the UK in 2003 and founded her own company. Um, she has recently, uh, we'll hear more about uh, uh, the story, but she decided to um, liquidate the company um, and we, like a phoenix rising, we um, uh, have a rebirth in many ways uh, with, with her, uh, her um, dance um, uh, as a dance artist and making work again. Um, she is, uh, I mean, to her credit, she's had an amazing um, uh, list of um, Choreographic um, uh, projects. Um, she um, choreographed the Commonwealth Games uh, for the handover ceremony in 2018. Uh, her solo piece um, was um, uh, the Guardian's um, uh, and the Observer's top five um, uh, uh, of dance uh, dance performances of, of 2021. And um, we'll find out more about her. She, she has a, a fantastic uh, uh, portfolio. Uh, of of um, dance making and creating um, amazing work. Second on the panel, um, welcome, Mr. Bronislaw Weinstein. Weld, uh, Weldstein, um, you probably know um, Mr. Weldstein. He's a writer, journalist, uh, columnist for the weekly. Um, forgive my pronunciation. Sechi, yes, uh, uh, yes, and uh, uh, you probably know that he's written many novels. Um, he is uh, a prominent member of, and um, uh, he was a prominent member of the opposition movement in Poland in the 1970s and uh, when um, uh, uh, the early 80s when, when Solidarity was founded. So um, he's, he's, he's featured on television, on Polish television frequently, and uh, we'll hear more about his thoughts um, uh, on this subject. And thirdly, our guest speaker in London, um, is uh, Alistair, uh, Alistair Donald. Now, Alistair uh, sadly can't be here. He's busy organizing uh, his own incredible debate uh, uh, project, uh, the Battle of Ideas Festival, which uh, opens in London. Uh, over 100 debates um, on similar ideas like this, but where freedom of expression and free speech is allowed and without um, uh, any bars or restrictions. Um, so do tune on that. That's going to be on the, uh, not this coming week, uh, the 15th, 16th of uh, October. So Alistair is a researcher, writer and editor. Um, he's associate director of the Academy of Ideas, which organizes the Battle of Ideas Festival. Um, and um, he's written uh, on, uh, on numerous uh, subjects related to architecture. And uh, uh, one, of, uh, one of the most popular um, pieces that he co-authored uh, is um, a manifesto um, uh, for architecture, which was called Towards a New Humanism in Architecture. And that featured in what is now a Penguin classic uh, edition of uh, manifestos called the 100 Artists Manifestos. And that's certainly worth reading from futurism to fairly recent stuff. Um, so. Without further ado, I really would like to hear more from the speakers, and then we'll ha uh, we'll have a conversation, and there'll be plenty of time for you to ask questions, to give some brief thoughts uh, on your reflections uh, about um, the conversation. So please, can we have a round of applause for our speakers? So, Agnieszka. Thank you. I would like to ask for the images. 
Uh, so I would like to talk about an artist, uh, Ivona Kikia. Her work was uh, brought to my attention by a friend of mine, Marianna, who was co-organizing co the festival Passion for Freedom with me uh, in Britain, in London, um, for the last 12 years. Um, I would also um, like to uh, welcome, I just forgot to mention, uh, with Manik that I would like to welcome Taslim and, for, and thanking her for coming to join us tonight. Taslim is the artist that is the author of the artwork that we used to promote the event, Taslim Mulhal, and her work is The Silence and is fronting our discussion on art and identity politics. So thank you very much for flying from London, making this huge effort and joining us. Um, so if the audience would like to ask you a question later when we have more open uh, conversation, you're welcome to ask her questions too, because I think your image is quite provoking, thought-provoking, so there might be questions coming from audience. So going back to Ivona Kikia, so Marianna um, brought my attention to her work um, on Facebook uh, because there were quite a lot of comments about her work. and. Um, I talked to the artist yesterday and um, she paints her reality. She paints um, the reality she lives in, where, when she goes shopping, when um, she's visiting the, the local community. She lives in Britain for the last 17 years. Uh, she studied history, she's a self-taught artist. And um, she chose a, a style that is really expressive. It's, it's um, it's showing the reality, but in a very expressive way. And you might um, you might be shocked by the way it's being portrayed, but it's exactly what she she sees around herself. So this work is the queen and her subjects. <coughs> uh, <laughs> um, so this is the, the the first of her paintings. Can I can I have the second one, please? Uh, this one is portraying the rented house in the UK. Um, I, I lived in Britain for 20 years, so I know that there is lots of houses and flats where you're sharing the space because it's really expensive to, to either buy your own place or even for renting, it's really expensive to, to rent a whole flat for yourself. So uh, sharing is really common even until very late age. Uh, and the, 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 the rent prices are going even up now as we speak and as Manning was mentioning whether this whole uh, culture war is not kind of a smokescreen for us not to talk about the real issues and to fight on this very low level uh, where actually this, this crisis is touching everyone. Uh, so here we, we can see the mixture, the, the multitude of different characters sharing the space uh, and here it's a rented um, flat. Can I have the third image, please? Here we have a party. And the fourth image. And this is the London bus, and that's the artwork that actually caused this huge uh, discussion on Facebook. Uh, and it was really fascinating how it was unfolding, because she was accused of racism uh, for painting this, this, this picture. While a lot of uh, commentators said, but this is just a London bus. Have you been on the London bus? Did, did you live in London? I lived there, or I've been there, and I lived, and I, I was on the bus. So this is just the reality. Uh, and actually, since um, the image was posted last week and commented, and there was a big discussion about it, whether it's real art or not, whether you're allowed to paint paintings like this. And she also told me this anecdote that she was accused that she painted the, the, the lips red and that this is racist. And then she commented that it was just an artistic um, way of... of uh, finding the artistic way of expressing um, the shape better. And that was her intention. It wasn't even related to whether to, to any uh, underlying uh, meaning or um, social comment. It, it was just, it just worked for her artistically to express and to, to make the a better composition. So since this huge kerfuffle uh, on, the, on the Facebook, um, the image has been removed, and this is the only image on her artistic uh, webpage on Facebook that was removed. None of these other images that I have shown 
and, and there's many more of them in the similar style, um, shopping in Asda, um, drinking in a beer, uh, drinking beer in the garden during summer. Uh, none of these other images was censored. This one was removed. And also her Facebook account has been blocked and she cannot use it. So um, I guess sooner or later she will be removed completely. And I think it will be also part of our con conversation here why people are being removed from public life, why having a very complex reality around ourselves, we are not allowed to discuss this complexity. And if there are any problems, we are not allowed to find solutions together because it seems we are being divided more and more. Um, and this, this division seems to be uh, serving a purpose. And I'm quite interested in us maybe looking at that and um, asking questions and, and, and seeing also what the public here thinks. Thank you. Thanks, Agnieszka. Rosie. Um, thank you. And I think I've maybe prepared a little bit too much. So if, if, if can you give me a two minute warning or something? Thank you. Um, um, my name's Rosie Kay. I'm a dancer, choreographer. Director, um, can I have my uh, introduction slides? Thank you. And um, I think I kind of dance a lot into and try and dance out of trouble, it seems. Um, can I have the slide one, please? Uh, the next slide, thank you. Um, so I wanted to start by talking about um, a solo that I made uh, through lockdown. Uh, I was a performer. My first job was in Polish dance theatre, actually and I performed around uh, the world and then I almost gave up and I became a choreographer settling in my adopted city of Birmingham, which is a very, very multicultural, um, non-white majority city, one of the youngest cities in Europe. Um, I gave up dancing uh, after the birth of my son and the birth of my son was quite traumatic and I just focused on the past seven or eight years being a choreographer. But something inside me was kind of urging to speak and to speak as a older woman, as an older dancer. And so I created a, a solo, first called Adult Human Female, and then I was convinced by my management to tone it down and I called it Adult Female Dancer. Um, it's sort of a piece based in seven parts about my life. It's my first and my only autobiographical work. Um, it mentions I was born on a border. I was born neither in Scotland nor England. I was born 13 months after the death of my brother. And so I was born into a family dealing with grief. And for me, dancing was a way to create joy, but also to understand the world. And it still is the only time I really can understand the complexity of the world. It talks about the amazing career I had, the standing ovations I've had, the opera houses I've danced in, meeting the Queen, dancing in front of Prince Andrew, but also about some of the really terrible things that happened to me in my escapades, my adventures, getting my hip nulled in a bar, getting abducted in a taxi, getting messed up with the mafia in New York, and getting attacked by my ex-partner. I talk about my multiple injuries, most of them on stage, broken jaw, broken fingers, broken elbow, all done while performing or on, in rehearsals, and the near death of both me and my son during childbirth. And I talk about my body, my body as a woman, raped, assaulted, harassed, but being a woman in these experiences have not been because of my identity. Being a woman is not in my head. And then I end it talking about the sheer joy and exhilaration of dancing, the beauty of living absolutely in the moment, the discipline, the grit, the pain and the joy. And it ends with a big, huge, explosive solo to Patti Smith. I'd spent a couple of years uh, researching as well, reading, going back to sort of key texts of the second wave feminism. And I have a year as the artist in residence at the University of Oxford at the School of Anthropology. Like I do, you know, I'm saying I do my research. And I was very lucky. I thought, oh, I've done okay. I got fantastic reviews in both The Guardian and The Observer. It was named as a top piece of dance of 2021. And I was nominated as the most outstanding female performer, which as a as a dancer of 46 years old was, was, was quite astonishing to me. I think I thought I'd come out as a gender critical feminist. It was in all the papers. Meanwhile, 
Next slide. I was also, coming out of COVID, creating a piece called Romeo and Juliet. Sorry, an adaptation of Romeo and Juliet. You've all heard of Romeo and Juliet. Um, I was, I'd spent about five years researching this work. Um, I was setting it in contemporary Birmingham, the city that I adopted. And I'd worked in community groups and um, lived through three riots uh, in that city. Um, during that five years, I worked very closely with a school called Nelson Mandela School that uses Shakespeare at its core curriculum. It's a secular school, um, but its population is 98% Muslim. And so these children had actually a better knowledge of, of Shakespeare than, than I. So it was a fantastic group. I worked with the all, all of year five and all of year six. So that's about sort of uh, 10 to 12 year old children. And particularly with the support of the teachers, we looked at issues that are both in Romeo and Juliet and relevant to these young people's life. Uh, themes of violence, of forced marriage, child marriage, FGM, domestic violence. And the key question for me, are you free to love who you choose? So I tested the ideas out with the children. I was kind of shocked because I work a lot with children, but I, I sensed there was a, a stronger sense of violence there was more kind of um, ways that they could portray violence through dance. Um, there have been quite a lot of stabbings, both in London and Birmingham and other English cities. Um, and following that, I worked with gang members, uh, former gang members and current gang members. And then I spent uh, several weeks embedded with West Midlands police. Um, what really struck me was visiting parents of children who had got involved with county lines, which is sort of children that get involved in dealing drugs from the cities out into country towns. Um, there was a young boy from Birmingham found in Aberdeen alone. He was 12 years old. And uh, the police thought he could still be convinced to kind of like get on the straight and narrow, as it were. And it was only through talking to him that we realized that his allegiance was now to the gang and not to his family. Uh, the gang had been giving him sweeties from when the mother had moved a single parent from London when they, she couldn't live in London anymore, and they'd be giving him sweeties and ice cream from the age of five. I also spent time with the politicians and police crime commissioners, and I saw the contradiction between shutting all the youth centres, closing all the arts activities, closing all the after-school activities, the gang violence, and the way that the government occasionally chucked a million pounds to Birmingham to stop the next riot. Through that, I auditioned nine dancers. Um, I had a cast of three Asian heritage dancers, three black dancers, and three white dancers. They all auditioned for sex-based roles. Two of the dancers self-identified as non-binary. And we had a really interesting process. I use a lot of improvisation, task-based. Uh, we're looking at gangs, drugs, intimidation, sex, love, violence. Um, you know, it's a big, big piece. It was for the main stage, so that's like large scale, proscenium, you know, big, big theatres. And I was 10 days away from my premiere. Um, I felt there was a strange vibe in the, atmosphere, in the atmosphere in the studio. I'm used to telling a lot of stories. I'm used to giving actual, real, concrete examples to every bit of movement and choreography that I want to make. But I started to feel a little bit anxious and paranoid in the studio. I put it down to couple of things, there's been COVID regulations, we weren't socialising, um, but also my father had died recently and I was feeling quite emotionally raw, looking at grief and death in such a profound way on stage. And then I got pulled up for making a joke in ballet and I was told that I was misgendering two of the dancers. And I said, well, actually I was just joking about ballet and boys jumps and girls boy jumps. I dance ballet. I love the boys' jumps. They're huge. They're massive. You jump around the whole room. I don't like the girls' jumps, the petit allegro. But I was taken aside and told that I was misgendering people. And I kind of started to question everything I had to say in the studio. And when you're making choreography, it's quite fast. It's uh, quite complex. Uh, you need to think on your feet. These were sex-based roles. Uh, this was about sex and violence, this show. And I found myself getting really tangled up in my mind about male and female and our bodies. And the honesty of the space that we come into in order to create art, if people are coming in already with constructed identities, how do I find any honesty to tell other stories, to tell the stories of these children, to tell the stories of Shakespeare? 
So I invited the dancers to a party at my house, which I normally do. I cook lots of different vegan, vegetarian, pescatarian and meat eating options. Um, we put candles in the garden. I share the house with my husband and my seven year old son and everything was very fine. And they drank lots of wine and then they drank a lot of my nice French wine collection. And it was getting very late into the night and my husband tried to kick everyone out. I mean, really late, like 2 a.m. And they asked me what my next show would be. And I was already a couple of years into researching Orlando by Virginia Woolf. We got into, I'd, I'd, I'd been working with an LGBT group. I'd been working with some trans people I'd contacted and I'd kind of come to the conclusion that I was going to make my own interpretation of this show, but I wasn't quite sure exactly how that was going to look. We got into a debate. Uh, I think their point was that Orlando, because they start off as a male aristocrat, halfway through the novel, they turn into a woman. And there's not a big deal about it, but Virginia Woolf's incredibly witty and imaginative about this change to this kind of wet hero who becomes quite a powerful heroine. Um, and I disagreed. I, I, I didn't know if this could be a trans, a non-binary, a male or a female performer. It just had to be somebody extraordinary on stage to hold that role through a full length work. The, the, argue, the, the debate turned to argument and I tried to make the argument that women's sex based rights are based on understanding that sex is binary and immutable and that if we erase the word woman uh, from language, we start to erase it in law and we will lose our female women's based sex based protections. I also then did try to draw their attention to what was happening with children and the Tavistock Centre, which uh, I'm pleased to say has been closed down by the CAS report, um, and that children were being indoctrinated to think that they could be trans and put down a line of sterilisation or body mutilations which are lifelong and can affect their set there can affect their ability to both have a fulfilled sexual life and also to have children this was seen as beyond the pale and they went out very disgruntled when i got back into work i knew that i'd faced i faced a wall of opposition and it's kind of a choreographer's worst nightmare i called in my board and my management to help support me and I thought that we could get this cleaned up fairly quickly in that my opinions are legal and now protected in law. Thank you to Mayor Forstarter. What followed then was four months of absolute hell. I went through the first investigation. I was exonerated. One dancer appealed. I then went through a second investigation and by accident found out that they were employing their own lawyers paid for by my company's money. They wanted me to go through an HR investigation who was in the same law firm. And I discovered that one of my trustees of the charity was also related to this law firm. He was a partner. I was turned down any level of support and I was sent to a psychiatrist who very fortunately told me that I was not going mad. At that point, I actually thought I was. They refused to meet or talk with me. You've got to bear in mind, this company was called Rosie K Dance Company. Um, and they started to send false reports with no evidence to both my funders, the Arts Council and the Charities Commission. Suddenly I was being given arbitrary deadlines and they refused a pause on the investigations when my father-in-law went for emergency cancer surgery, bearing in mind just months after my father had died of cancer. So I spoke to my lawyer, I spoke to my mentor, I spoke at the last minute to the Free Speech Union and I spoke to some people for some media support and I resigned. Next slide, please. Oh, that was Orlando. I missed that one. I'm hoping to do that in a couple of years. Next slide, please. Um, I did one interview with The Times and um, with Janice Turner, because I knew she, she understood some of the issues affecting women speaking out about sex-based rights. Um, I cited constructive dismissal, as in I could no longer continue my job and discrimination based on my beliefs. And I wasn't going to go quietly. The basis of 17 years of work has been making work from the female perspective. The female body is essential to my work. I've trained with the army and made a piece that's been endorsed by the army that has the female perspective on war. 
I was not going to be shut down and told that I could not talk about this. So there was quite a lot of shock in the dance world. And it was in some other press. Uh, there was a negative report in the BBC. Um, and the dancers wrote an open letter with absolute defam defamation within it. Very luckily, the Free Speech Union supported me in putting a crowdfunder together, and that's helped me pay for the legal support I've needed over the past year. So, oh, so, so I lost my job for stating that I believe in the reality of sex. And if we erase the meaning of the word woman, we erase all our sex-based protections. I think there's several things going on. One is that the young people have been ideologically captured. Um, I don't doubt that they think they're right. I just think they need to be aware that we also have our own beliefs and there is freedom of thought, freedom of expression and freedom of speech. I think our institutions are weakened. There is a culture of fear of complaints. I have three incidences of theatre directors refusing to programme my work, not because they don't like my work, but due to concerns raised by their members of staff about my so-called beliefs. There's a lack of understanding of the law, the role and the duties of directors and charities, the role of trustees to look after the short, medium and long term of a charity, and the understanding of what the arts are there to do. I think there's an economy of grifters, those that peddle equality, diversity and inclusion, trans inclusion, anti-racism, unconscious bias, all making money from training these institutions. Social media, amplifies the voices of the deranged, the upset, the not well, the pylons, furthering division. And political parties are either captured, capitulated, terrified, or using it as an easy way to win the votes from those on the left or the right who disagree with certain extreme ideological positions. In the UK, this is filtering now into government and state institutions, the police, the judiciary, the church, education and HE. By not joining in, by not using pronouns, for example, you're now outing yourself as someone who will not go along with a new ideology and you're put on a watch list. I think for me, the most important thing has been to question just how fragile and vulnerable the arts are and that we need to do a more to make sure that we protect the arts and protect our freedom of speech. Thank you. Mr. Wildstein. Yeah. We've heard um, some examples of interventions in defense, uh, supposedly in defense uh, of uh, minorities that are being oppressed, discriminated. And these minorities uh, people who speak in their favor, uh, they impose a certain censorship in art, because in both cases, uh, we, uh, we've we seen censorship, maybe in the second case, a little bit less. It was censorship against art itself. However, the, well, op <clears throat> attack on the opinions of, of a choreographer, but, uh, the first case was a direct censorship, in my view. Uh, an artist uh, had every right to show her view of the reality, um, a bit deformed um, or caricaturesque in order to um, expose some of the world uh, phenomena and to be able to examine them um, closely, and uh, this is not permitted when it's, it refers to certain groups, and uh, these groups will have such an um, opinion, such a view. And otherwise, the artists will be cancelled, uh, and uh, possible they, they could also suffer some other uh, consequences. This uh, is quite as an incredible story about certain ideas or ideologies that refer to freedom, uh, to tolerance, uh, to being open, uh, to pluralism, but uh, actually 
they are denying uh, these uh, notions. And we, I think, are witnessing this kind of situation in the West. The dominating ideology that has no name, I call it um, emancipation ideology, and I will explain why, this ideology tries uh, to impose on us a um, certain order of life um, and uh, art that um, is being carried out not only through social pressure but also through law and this is very uh, characteristic that this new um, emancipation ideology that it uses the law as uh, a tool to create a new reality um, let me mention some other uh, sentences. I'm, I'm, I will be speaking theoretically, I think. I, if I understand correctly, this is why I was uh, invited here. Um, maybe I, I might have some different opinions uh, from the other panelists, but anyway, um, talking about the ideology, uh, ideology of emancipation, I think uh, I'm calling this this way because emancipation is the key word. Uh, ideology is um, a modern phenomenon, and I th see that as a project of uh, organizing the world here and now in an optimal way. Like um, the world is uh, perceived in a rational way, so we are able to create it from the beginning in order to eliminate all the pains, uh, all the problems, and be able to create a new wonderful world with different um, ideologies. Uh, we could, s we have our experiences from the 20th uh, century, specific uh, ideas. I mean, we can imagine that we are able to build here and now a new great order, and uh, the whole evil is uh, the mm, consequence of our civilizational uh, mistakes. So why should a good uh, human being create a bad civilization? Um, I, I'm not going to get into details. It has been explained uh, by Hegel, for instance, or by some other post-Marxist. Uh, but always the main idea was to win over uh, or to break an existing civilization, to emancipate, which means to liberate from it. Um, in our times, this dominating ideology that, uh, in my belief, it has many different versions, is the ideology of emancipation of a man, emancipation by getting rid of all the limitations like a monad, a self-creating monad. So, traditional uh, limitations related to civilization, culture, etc., they are supposed to be an obstacle for uh, the people uh, to develop. And all the forms have certain limitations, but let's try to imagine the reality without any forms. And um, an example of this identity uh, politics uh, we are discussing today is quite um, relevant because it shows how some old forms are being replaced with the new forms. The old taboos and fetishes are being replaced with new ones. However, the problem is that, uh, you know, these traditional ones were created uh, by uh, many generations and uh, they mm, had a certain duration. Uh, in contrast, the new ones are being imposed in a very brutal way. And they are supposed to be an alternative to what had existed before. And if we talk about uh, this um, identity politics, the problem, in my view, is that the ones who um, created this uh, politics, they refer that to groups that are uh, believed uh, 
to be somehow worse or oppressed or um, eliminated or cancelled um, somewhere beyond uh, or behind the dominating culture. And the same uh, people just refuse to um, to accept uh, the natural human identities, uh, these existing identities uh, like cultural uh, identities, national, religious, etc. And also uh, the gender identity. Uh, however, it turns out that if we are to create ourselves from the beginning, we are we have these new forms that are imposed on us. And the law right now is being used as a tool to impose this new ideology. And as a consequence of that, it's uh, interpreted in a radically different way uh, in comparison with the law that we know from uh, the classical understanding, which was just a, a legal framework in which other systems regulating human behavior were um, active, like ethics, um, habits, customs, culture, and now the, these concepts are um, supposed to be re replaced with different laws, um, a different final order in the name of fighting against the intolerance or uh, exclusion, fight against all these negative uh, phenomena. So at the same time, well, it seems to be you know, for freedom. However, we must understand that this is the way of taking taking this freedom away uh, from us. And the examples we heard are, I think, very strong. In general, if the law uh, is no longer a framework and starts to regulate all the behaviors of a human being, uh, then it's, uh, it's a new totalitarian system uh, it doesn't have to be as brutal as we know from the tradition of the totalitarian model. However, in general, this um, the idea, um, you know, the existence of a certain network that organizes every aspect of human being and uh, plays a role in every aspect of human being, regulates every sphere of, of human life, this is a basic phenomenon related uh, to um, totalitarian ideas, totalitarianism. And let me come back to this idea of uh, natural communities. Of course, these natural uh, communities are attacked as um, the ones that don't, let's say, don't like uh, humans, uh, human beings. And uh, how, however, we need to understand that they constitute a, f a basic form of human existence. Uh, humans exist thanks to culture. We exist uh, thanks to culture, and we deeply believe uh, that an individual has a priority over um, the collective, uh, supremacy of individual over a collective. We think individually, we, we live individually, and it seems um, obvious for some people. But on the other hand, uh, we should reflect on how uh, we organize our experiences, our perceptions of the world, our understanding of the world. Uh, would we be able to do that without a language, without forms of culture? Would we be able uh, to free our human uh, potential? Uh, without these um, cultural surroundings, uh, culture that uh, sometimes um, somehow surpasses us. Uh, and this culture functions in certain um, versions or variants, um, national variants, I would say, today. It doesn't mean that a human being is reduced to that, but it means uh, that we are very strongly uh, formed or uh, influenced, uh, impacted by these uh, natural communities. A human being obviously has uh, two sexes, two ge the genders. It's fundamental. It doesn't actually mean that all the people are like this. Some people are 
are beyond these two uh, categories, but these are minorities. We cannot build our um, social order basing on this uh, minorities. And uh, what is more, we begin to impose uh, uh, this um, behaviors. We can see the LGBT, other generations, other genders that supposedly have should receive something and the whole ideology that we uh, um, create our gender ourselves. And this is in conflict with a different aspect of this ideology that says that uh, a, a human being cannot be imposed anything because uh, if someone is homosexual, well, he's homosexual or she. And these are paradoxes I mentioned. Uh, so if we um, reject natural communities, we need to construct new communities, uh, supposedly in uh, defense of the oppressed uh, minorities. But at the same time, we impose uh, this framework of a community and we reduce a human being to, the, uh, to, to that and it leads to a paradox. We don't want to reduce a human being to his or her biological uh, sex or gender. We say it's a, a phenom cultural phenomenon, but at the same time we reduce a human being to his or her sexual preferences. And this, uh, these are the basics to define a, a human being. And uh, this whole ideology is full of uh, paradoxes and internal contradictions. By nature, it uh, refers to some uh, to the material condition of the human being. At the same time, saying that. The, this basic differentiation of uh, human beings uh, into two categories, men and women, it doesn't bring any cut, uh, consequences because these are imposed by culture. Therefore, it does not take into account that the basic differences, the physical differences between the sexes must um, imply some other differences such as mental differences of course we are not we don't want to say uh, that some one category is better than the other but we uh, this ideology wants to make everything equal that everything is the same art always was supposed to be a sphere of freedom a sphere of discovering the world anew, of perceiving it in a different way. So the artist, the creator, had to have a margin of um, freedom to be able to um, carry out their artistic potential. Art also, from another point of view, was supposed to be expressive, a means of expression for the creator, the artist. So it required freedom once more. So we can see how the new ideology forces certain things on the artist, a certain order of things, and everybody who's against it, who doesn't accept it, is, in the best of the cases, is cancelled, is removed from public life, and in the worst of the cases, they are punished, legally punished. I can see that uh, my time is almost up, so I might uh, finish uh, my theoretic discourse um, with this. Uh, I think it's important to notice why the ideology that uh, refers to freedom and tolerance and openness and pluralism in fact contradicts all those values. We have seen many examples and we can see them every day. A world regulated by the law in every aspect is devoid of freedom because freedom law decides about everything. It's like having algorithms for everything. However, human beings can organize the world in different ways, in different cultures, and um, they might understand uh, their social reality in different ways. We know that uh, from our experience, but if everything is imposed uh, from up to the bottom, 
we speak about, we only speak about tolerance, but tolerance requires some axiology and anthropology. It requires to imagine what is a human being, how we define human dignity. If we question the traditional roles, tradition definition, a traditional definition of human dignity, and we refer to um, the identities that are built ad hoc, the question is, how can we be tolerant? Tolerance as such is uh, a certain virtue. It's a paradoxical virtue because it finds its own limits very quickly. How do we define tolerance? How can we be tolerant towards the people who are not tolerant themselves? When Where does the tolerance end? It needs to have some basis. It needs to have some support. If we speak that we have to be tolerant about other cultures such as Islam. So what about um, what Islam says about the other people who are not um, Muslims? The dogma is to punish them with death penalty. Uh, this happened to uh, Salman Rushdie um, that uh, received the fatwa from Khomeini because Khomeini decided that uh, Salman Rushdie's books, especially the satanic verses, uh, were an expression of um, blasphemy towards uh, Islam, the Islamic religion, because everybody who did not respect this religion has to be punished by death. Sharia is completely different from the Western uh, legal framework. The role of women is much smaller. There is no equality between uh, men and women. So the imagining that we can build a model where we can coexist with them it's a misunderstanding. I know that my time is up, so I will not develop those um, topics I will end here. Thank you. Thank you, Bonestor Einstein. Thank you. Uh, Alistair, we'll move on to you very quickly. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, really sorry that I can't be with you tonight. Um, I really did hope to come out to Warsaw, uh, but as Manik explained in the introduction, I, uh, I'm in a situation where we're about to host a major festival in London in the middle of October, Battle of Ideas Festival, um, which I'm caught up completely just now in making the arrangements for the, uh, I've been up since seven o'clock this morning doing uh, changes to the festival brochure and which has got to go to the printers later tonight. So it's just one of those moments where I'm afraid I couldn't make it out to Warsaw. Um, but nevertheless, it's, it's good to be able to take part in, in the conversation. And, you know, I should, I should say a little bit about the Battle of Ideas Festival, I think, because uh, Manic and Rosie uh, both are going to be speakers uh, in London next month uh, on, on, on sessions on identity politics and cancel culture within the arts. And it really is um, these, these discussions on identity and art are something that's grown more and more uh, part of the festival over, over recent years. And I think Rosie uh, very eloquently and powerfully uh, gave you an insight into why that is, because these have become huge issues affecting every single major uh, arts institution uh, in the country and, and you know, in the Western world, really, I think we have to admit. And they have incredible consequences, which lead to people being sacked or silenced or, or, or so on and so forth. So they're very, very important issues and looking forward to discussing them at the festival next month. And if anybody does fancy a trip over from Warsaw, then I'm sure if you were uh, to get in contact with the organisers tonight, they might be able to find you a, a cheap ticket that we could uh, give you if you want to come to London in, in, in the middle of October. Um, just in terms of uh, my remarks, I, 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 as I said, I, I thought Rosie spoke very interestingly about her personal experience within uh, an institution and the terrible consequences that identity politics can have in the arts world. And I was very struck by Bronislaw's um, description of, of, of the way that identity is just such, so full of contradictions and uh, in a way refuses to recognize the messy reality of, of, of human life and the way that art exists within it within that framework. I in, 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 in my remarks wanted to take a step back a little bit actually and to try and look at some of the reasons behind uh, where we are just now because I was very struck 
uh, by the blurb uh, that was written for uh, tonight's discussion. I just wanted to pick out one thing, actually, to highlight one thing and and to respond to, to use it and respond to it a little bit. Um, because at one point in the blurb, it says society is clamping down on freedom of expression for fear of offending minority identity groups. And I think obviously that's true, as, 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 as Rosie has explained uh, very well. My worry sometimes is that the the minority identity groups become associated uh, completely as the problem in this equation and the society that's doing the clamping down escapes uh, people's attention a little bit too much and I think it is very important to recognize when we're thinking about the influence of identity on on, on art that really um, this is not a question of a few minority groups uh, becoming offended at paintings or bits of music or things that are said, but is really uh, something that's been very much embraced in wider society. This idea the, the, the identity politics sits, I think, right the way throughout society. And it's, it's, re its impact is in some of the most elite uh, artistic institutions in, 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 the, in the Western world. So just to give an example, uh, if you look at the International Council of Museums meeting in, that took place in Prague a couple of uh, weeks ago, where all these uh, cultural figures gathered uh, to try and work out what the definition of a museum uh, was, and you, you, you might actually question why they need to work that out if they're heads of arts institutions. <laughs> Do they not know what a, a, a museum is? But no, no, all of these figures gathered in Prague for a big meeting where they tried to rewrite the defin of, definition of museums um, and, and develop some ideas they had a few years ago that museums had to be much more inclusive, polyphonic spaces that they had to safe guard diverse memories and all the sorts of phrases that many of us have become used to uh, hearing in, in, in and the jargon that many of us have become used to hearing in the arts world. Um, and they, you know, they, they uh, in, in a way, perhaps not surprisingly, rewrote the definition of, of museums as, as um, something that fosters diversity and sustainability. Now, these weren't minority groups that uh, uh, had this influence. This is mainstream Western cultural institutions that is, is effectively ripping up the things that they stand for uh, and, and, and creating arguably something new altogether, a completely different understanding of what culture and art and the institutions uh, that um, host art are, are, are all about. And I think in some ways, what, what you see is a situation where this question of identity is often projected way back into time. So people talk about uh, uh, the problem of colonialism or imperialism as being a, you know, a trashing black identity, for example. And this, this question of identity is sometimes eternalized in a way which I think is not quite right. Because one of the things about identity, and certainly the way that identity is used in contemporary discussion, is that I think it's a very new thing, a very modern thing. Certainly, if you read um, uh, academics and authors on, on the roots of this idea of identity, then it probably doesn't stretch back too much further than the Second World War. In fact, it very much comes to prominence in the 1950s and, and 1960s. Identity might have been used as a word for a long time, but often it was just a kind of casual word uh, to indicate a kind of self-sameness of, of people. I think the crucial thing that emerged in the 1960s was identity came to mean a consciousness of the difference between us. And I think that's, that's, that's a very different way that identity started to be discussed in, 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 in that period. And you know, it was only in that period when it came to uh, demark the differences between people that it became something that was very much used in the political and cultural uh, manner that we've become uh, very used to today. And I think, and again, I, I just want to kind of differentiate here between um, what's going on in, in, in the world of minorities and what's going on in mainstream society, because I very much put the emergence of identity as something that's a product of changes in mainstream society. And I think this is, it's quite important to locate uh, these changes here. So if you go back again to the 1960s, you might look at the unraveling of the 
big political movements and ideologies, which I think had a, a real influence in terms of uh, getting rid of universal ideas in society. Once you get rid of these big future orientated ideologies, then it opens the door for us to become much more uh, particular and much more group focused in the way that we think. Countercultural politics, I think, very much became about oppressed groups rather than uh, societal wide transformation. Um, if we think about the consumer culture that emerged in the 1960s, then in the, in, in individuated individuals became a uh, much more important lifestyle and identity and all of these things became important. Um, and then I suppose as you go a bit further than that, then the influence of an emergence of psychology is a very major force in society in terms of creating a much more sort of therapeutic understanding of, of who we are, I, th I, I think it's very important. So I, I, I just want to stress those fairly major societal changes um, because, you know, I, I think we need to get in context this, this emergence of, of, of what identity means. And the consequence of that, I think, if, you know, people often talk about things like the march through the, the institutions of a, a number of radicals. And you go back to the universities in the 1960s, and obviously there was some radical academics or whatever that gained uh, uh, more influence as, as, as the 60s went on. But you look at the world today, and it's not radical academics in Cambridge University, for example, that are making, making waves. It's the entire university, the entire institution has culturally adapted to the to the idea of, of, of how we understand identity. If you look at the arts institution, it's, you know, if you think uh, back to, um, for example, the Black Lives Matters protests uh, following the, mur the murder in America uh, uh, a couple of years ago, then it was all the major elite institutions in society that responded to that by introducing all these new policies and doing their Instagram posts with black squares and, 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 and so on and so forth. It was the kind of, in, in London, it was the Royal Court and the Royal Opera House and uh, uh, supported by fairly major institutions like the British Council. You know, these are not uh, radical uh, left field movements in society. They're absolutely mainstream. And I, I, I did want to stress that. And, and you know, even just now, you think about the people that are sponsoring institutions. Um, the, 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 the identity politics outlook has infiltrated uh, and, and I, I would argue has become part of the culture of very mainstream corporations. So if you think about someone like Ernst Young, which is a major accountancy firm, a uh, global accountancy firm that sponsors lots of different arts institutions. If you go to their website, you, you can tell that the entire, you know, this comes from the boardroom. This is not some radical uh, sitting in, in, in the shop floor making costumes or whatever within, or doing commissioning paintings within the institution. These are instructions that come from the board stream of mainstream corporations. It's a kind of, I think we can say that there's been a cultural shift throughout society that is responsible uh, for a lot of these things. So what are the consequences of some of this? I just want to, just a couple of uh, uh, thoughts. Um, as I say, if, if you look at uh, the, the University of Cambridge, to take just one example, and its music course, uh, it runs a it, it, it music it faculty of music. It runs a course called Decolonizing Your Ears, uh, which is the idea being that that um, you know there's there's all these suspect morally suspect uh, composers that came about in the in the period 17th 18th century European society who they have been according to these people are now associated with uh, imperialism and colonialism and, and, and are treated suspect uh, because of those those associations and they are being systematically removed or reinterpreted within these 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 institutions and I, I think this is a real problem because uh, if you you know art is there to be engaged with by all of us we all have to engage with art and, and, and come to our own conclusions and make our own judgments. I mean, that, that's the deal with art. It's, it's, it, uh, it's, it's the artist's work, 
but it's a subjective and in interpretation of all of us. If we're now being told that the only interpretation of art is the one that these uh, identitarian influenced inst institutions place on it, then effectively you've really got to ask, well, is it really art anymore? Because if you're not free to create the art that you want, then it seems to me that it has very little worth and and and, and almost is is um uh you know not really um worthy of, of of the name art. And I think these 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 are incredibly important development we have to kind of understand and, and, and get behind. I mean, if if you can't, if, if your interpretation of Handel and Mozart and Beethoven, for example, is one that's imposed on you and you're not allowed to interact with that music, then how are you ever going to understand the music that came after it by Stravinsky or Schoenenberg or whatever? Art is always I think conversation between the present and the past is it's only through that conversation that that art can exist. And if you're shutting off history, shutting off the past and reinterpreting it, reinterpreting it in a way that uh, we cannot all contribute in a, some sort of democratic form, then I think you're actually undermining uh, the whole possibility of having art itself. And I think that's the, the direction that uh, art and identity is, is, is unfortunately leading up to. And that's before you even get into the kind of policing of cult cultural boundaries that now seem to be, you know, it's, it's almost like art institutions these days exist for a kind of sending of a political message rather than de the development of a piece of art. And I think that really is uh, a little bit of a tragedy. So hopefully in the discussion, we can go on and, and, and discuss some of these things. I've got lots more uh, ideas about the impact of some of these things, but maybe I should leave it there. I think probably my 15 minutes is up. Thank you very much, Alistair. And uh, thank you to all um, of our four speakers. Um, so thoughts? Um, Really, we could go straight into audience questions, or we can start to um, uh, comment on some of the various uh, thoughts and ideas that we had. Um, but I can see someone who's very keen to ask a question, so why, uh, I'll, we'll pass the microphone to you if you wait. Um. How are you doing? My name is Michal Zachowski, but I will speak Polish if you don't mind. I'll try to speak slowly. Yeah, od wielu lat. For many years, uh, I'm not only a journalist, uh, but I also a human rights activist. I cooperate with uh, people from Tibet and Dalai Lama. And people ask me quite often if what I do is okay. If, for example, fighting for some rights of people from Tibet, um, um, I cooperate with different uh, national groups, ethnic groups, but le let me mention this symbolic example of uh, Tibetan people. but. Uh, if if someone says Dalai Lama Tibet, everyone smiles in the West. Uh, maybe because they are um, not familiar with the topic. With the topic, so what about the fight for uh, uh, the people from Tibet uh, for the right to have uh, their own country? Uh, isn't it uh, imposing uh, some Western values? In my opinion, no. There is no such thing as Western values. There are universal values. And I'm a very pragmatic person. I work on a very uh, fundamental and basic document signed by uh, actually all the countries in the world, uh, the, human, uh, the Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, um, the, the People's Republic of China also signed that uh, United Nations document, uh, uh, the Declaration of Human Rights. And of course, it's nice to uh, talk theoretically and uh, to go on for hours talking about different things, but I really recommend you to read this short text, the Declaration of Human Rights. The first article says that all the people have right uh, to uh, vote and choose their um, governments, and uh, that, that's, I think, the, one of the best definitions of democracy. The United Nations uh, uh, is United Nations, all the nations, not only Western nations, and if we talk about the so-called Western, Western values, which means that there are also Eastern values, and we should not uh, 
uh, try to impose our values to China, Russia, etc. We need to start from the fundamentals, from uh, the Declaration of Human Rights or constitutions of certain countries. But what uh, is uh, signed, I don't feel good with this because people from this primitive countries like Western Europe, they come to Poland. And in Poland, since 1918, uh, there was emancipation of women and women can, um, have um, re received their right to vote in 1918. France in 1944, uh, Switzerland in the 70s. And so if you want to learn from ourselves how to fight fascism, communism, uh, and uh, liberal fascism, uh, feminism, and homonism, Please feel invited, uh, because uh, I see your faces and uh, you conclude that here you have some freedom of expression and here is an area of responsibility. For 600 years uh, in Poland, uh, Muslims, Jews have lived here and uh, there is harmony here. If you want uh, to know something about a normal society. Okay, thank you very much. Um, no, I think there's very, some very important points you made there. Um, so, um, any more questions? So, if not, we're going to uh, talk uh, uh, amongst the panel members uh, because uh, I think there's quite a lot of uh, interesting things around. Um, you know, what is um, uh, if if um, corporations are taken over what was initially grassroots uh, protests like Black Lives Matter, which you know was an initial response to a horrendous. Uh, racist killing of an of a, of a African-American by the American police, uh, then it seemed to take on a different life. Um, you know, what, does, does radicalism then become appropriated by um, uh, cultural institutions, by corporates? Uh, that's a question to think about, in my opinion. Um, I also think there's a lot of things to think about, about the majority and the minority, um, traditional um, values of or, or identities of family, um, of uh, nationhood, of um, certain other traditions um, uh, in, in the West, obviously uh, Christianity, but also, as you said, in other parts of the world, there's other uh, majority religions. Um, and, and the minority, um, you know, the minority seems to be very fragmented. It just fragments and fragments until it becomes a series of particles that doesn't seem to cohere. Uh, so, um, uh, thoughts on um, some of the spe uh, uh, some of the wonderful presentations we, we sp spoke about. Who would like to kick off? Um, Agnieszka, very quick. I just have one point. I actually wanted to agree with Alistair and um, with with the part where we seem to focus quite a lot on the minorities and then we don't look at the institutions and then the wider society. I found it really fascinating and thank you for reminding us about about that and in this context um, I wanted to refer to my notes um, and especially the recent uh, report um, on the Telford child sexual exploitation scan scandal. Uh, the report is from a three-year inquiry into child sexual exploitation. Um, it was released in July this year and um, this is not just Telford, it's Rochdale, Rotherham, Oxford, all over Britain uh, for the for the last um, almost 30, 40 years. Um, in Rotherham, um, the report from 2014 concluded that an estimated 1,400 children have, had been sexually abused in Rotherham between 1997 and 2013. Um, in Telford, it was more than 1,000 girls that have been abused over a 40-year period. And the agencies, that means governmental agencies like social services, um, police, um, local councils, they were blaming victims for the abuse they suffered. And here I would refer to what Alistair said, that what apart from the, 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 the level of the abuse, the, the children, the girls um, suffered, um, the fact that they were treated like a white trash, um, they were degraded um, because of being women, uh, because of being free. Uh, they were also then degraded by the social services and the police uh, because they were seen as being from a lower class. That's why not worthy attention and support and being listened to because when they were even reporting the abuse, they were dismissed and seen as sluts. Uh, they were threatened with um, 
killing their families, burning them, stabbing them. And the, the governmental agencies, they were nervous about discussing issues related to race and to even looking into this issue and, and unpacking it. And I think, that, as Alistair said, I think this is a bigger problem that we're trying to uh, perpetuate this um, uh, fantasy of everything is wonderful, uh, the more diverse, um, the more mixed, the better, and never, never looking into the darker corners and openly discussing these issues to together find solutions. And, and I think it's a great scandal. Well, I, I, after sort of six years of living and working abroad, actually going back to the UK, I found it an incredibly tolerant society. So I went back in 2003, um, and uh, I don't think it's a racist society. I don't think it's systemically racist. I don't think it's systemically um, sexist. I, I think it has certain issues. However, back in 2003, when I first returned back to the UK, um, there was huge investment in communities and I could make a very you know, decent living doing the hard work, properly doing the hard work. As I mentioned with Romeo and Juliet, when I was wandering around Birmingham, every single youth centre had been shut down. Every, the only sports was if you qualified for Aston Villa, which is like, you know, biggest football, one of the biggest football clubs in the world. Just recreational clubs, activities, ways to meet other children, to um, work together, to play together, to create together, to perform together. All of those things have been drying up in the UK over the past, sort of like since the kind of uh, economic crash of 2008, actually. So I can't blame it entirely on the Conservatives. Um, art has disappeared entirely from schools. Um, it's very rare to get any kind of like decent arts training. So the whole world of the imagination, the creativity, is being kind of stunted on lots of level and all of those people that were in those communities doing that work and seeing what was going on they've disappeared there's a lot of cultural gatekeepers um whether it be the curatorial world or the sort of gatekeepers in theaters or if there's anything open that kind of take large amounts of money to pay for themselves and their administration um and and i think you know that all the tools are there to prevent these things happening, but those tools have not been used and are not being used, and all the means in order to protect and give children and young people ways out have started to sort of wither and die. So I think it is a, it is a sad um, situation. I think the sort of the cowardice of the politicians, though, who, who won't confront this, and there's, been, there's not been a public inquiry despite countless calls over the past four or five years, um, I think is a disgrace. Can I, can I just come in on that point? Because I, th I think Rosie makes a very important point there, that uh, a lot of the time, Britain is portrayed as a systematically racist country, and it's absolutely not. I mean, it's got very low levels of racism in, 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 in so many ways. And I think that's a very important point to, to note, because if you, uh, like, like myself and Manic and Rosie, have all lived through uh, the, the last six years when we have brexited from the European Union and taken a decision to stand outside of that institution, then all of those who sought to remain in the European Union have always accused uh, those that wanted to leave of being racist and 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 uh, anti-immigrant and so on and so forth. And I, I I think that's that that just simply isn't true. So it's a very important point that that Rosie makes uh, to to combat uh, the idea that Britain is a systematically racist place. But I think at the same time, what happens is 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 that in the effort to portray Britain as systematically racist, then one of the things that institutions in the state do is they they operate on the basis that it is, and they put into place all these mechanisms to stop so-called the, the, all the so-called racism that's going on, and that actually creates a barrier to uh, the way that society operates because it puts in place it it it, it means that those in positions of authority are nervous about acting in instances where there are particular problems and some of the, the problems that Agnieszka 
mentioned in terms of the, the what's going on in northern cities, it means that the status becomes very reluctant to deal with those small number of instances where there is a genuine problem and where it does need to intervene and it does need to take action because there they themselves become scared of being portrayed as racist. So it's important to get the right balance on this, this problem. Britain is not a racist society, but the elevation of an identity outlook and a multiculturalist uh, political approach within British society has stopped the state dealing with the particular dangerous instances when they occur. Thanks, Munster. I saw some, um, we'll take uh, a couple of questions and we'll come back to Mr. Wildstein. Um, Hello. Um, I was very happy to come here and uh, I would like to say to Rosie Kay that it was very important to me to listen to your story, to share those personal experience because I guess that council culture is a very real um, concept concept today. But uh, on the other hand, uh, we are here talking about uh, mm, how to say um, identities and different minorities. Uh, when we don't have any of those mon minorities among us. And what I see really problematic is that um, we are talking here, talking uh, about, I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, we are talking about all of these things, uh, but we are not taking into consideration the fact that we are confronting a um, very serious issue of like finding another language to speak about all those things. And uh, without understanding that activism became our new mainstream posture and that we have to try to understand all of this, okay? Because um, I consider what is happening right now in culture and in politics as one organism. And uh, the fact that we have council culture um, is the fact of being in a, is because we've been in a very like weird political systems. I mean, I was trying to say that we are talking all about all about about all of this uh, without taking into consideration that it was caused by politics and our systems. You know, so. Uh, yeah, basically, I just wanted to say that because we are now here um, trying to understand, talking about art, but on the other hand, we are like focusing on those mi minorities as if they were guilty. Okay, this is my impression about this. Thank you. I mean, just to counteract that, there are quite a lot of people, artists and writers from minority groups who will criticize um, that the fragmentation that goes on within um, uh, race and gender identity mm -hmm. politics, particularly. Yeah, well, it's, it's, there are more. Um, yeah. So we can take on this question there from the floor. Yes. I would like to start saying that we've been uh, listening about different phenomena and we are experiencing a new identity politics. It's like a phenomenon that we perceive as something unavoidable and that something is part that will progress. But we have a very little distance towards this topic. And if someone knows history and has more distance to that, is able to look from afar, stand back and look at it. We've had uh, such situations in the history that people were thinking that Things will go like this and progress will look like this. But then history changed completely. So they were wrong. So we should be careful not to think that it's a law of nature. Because from the point of view of different decades, it's just a couple of decades. It's not that much from the point of view of history. And secondly, we've been listening and hearing people say about minorities we divide the we divide people into smaller and smaller minorities for example political community 
nation can be treated as a political community, a community of citizens. So in order to uh, for that community of citizens to exist and self-govern, we need, we require a minimum of uh, feeling of community to, to, for the people to feel that they are a part of community. So if we reduce ourselves into our minority groups and minority identities, we lose the wider community, the citizenship attitudes. So in such situation, we, democracy is no longer possible. We have a fragmented minorities who fight against each other for privilege, for a privileged position. And this is a lesson that we must learn. It's about how uh, national unity is broken and also European unity is broken. Of course, it's uh, mainstream right now because the strongest uh, communities are benefiting from it. Democracy is about majorities having the last word. If majority cannot say anything and we just have many, many minorities fighting with each other, we have some arbiters who create the establishment nowadays and who decide, who impose some uh, solutions through the law. And those cannot be uh, questioned politically anymore. So they force that on politics, they, they force it on the arts and so on. And another horrible thing, we have been speaking about multi multicultural societies. So if we treat culture seriously, then of course there are many definitions of culture, but all those definitions could be summed up in one into one. It's a way of organizing social life, public life. There is no possibility to create community organized in different ways. Of course, we have heard examples of Islam and Western culture. We could develop that further. We know examples from history where we had different cultures coexisting with each other in the same state, in the same country. But at that time, we had totalitarian, authoritarian government that organized the life of all those people. Frederick Brodel is a known historian who definitely was not a rightist. You cannot say that. He said that the um, most dangerous thing, the most dangerous conflict was intercultural conflict. So we must remember that and be aware of that, that there is always some dominant culture that is um, can be seen in the law, legal framework. If we question that, we open a space for arbitrary um, decisions from those who have the power and a permanent conflict. I'm sorry, the speaker is not using the microphone, so we cannot you hear need it. You need to use the microphone. So if we speak about the truth, listening to you, Mr. Bronisław, I'm, I have the impression that you would like to say to us that there is one single truth and majority has the last word and is the most important. So the democracy of the God Father is just the only kind of democracy there might be. Can we have more exchange of thoughts and not just one person speaking? So we're here, we, we can already see people uh, arguing and entering into conflict, although I have not finished talking yet. So I can uh, pinpoint who is uh, guilty for that and what organizations are guilty for that. The media nowadays are guilty for that. The internet is guilty. And 
what you are trying to force on us, that the majority uh, has the right to say and the right word. I know that democracy works like that, but we cannot um, disrespect minorities. And you, I think you express disrespect to, because you spoke about some kind of LGBT community. That was disrespectful. And I read your last essay you wrote on the first pages about the Virgin Mary that was the figure of the motherhood and that was the most important and you said that uh, LGBT communities were pathological and that feminists hate their own gender. Thank you. That's all from me. I would like to respond to you if I may. Can I? Yes, please. So, those games with the truth you uh, present another variant of truth. We do not have to agree. We can s have a different opinions. That's about that's talking. What's talking about? And not just pronouncing sounds. If we are talking, if we are in dialogue, we confront our different points of view, and we try to understand what we understand. Saying speaking about truth, you say. I agree, I'm happy that you admit that uh, in democracy, majority has uh, a word. But if you say, not in just some particular matters, when someone is repressed, what does it mean, repressed? For example, in Poland, I think that Poland is a free country, very free country. So uh, it doesn't happen that, uh, what Miss um, Rosie Kay uh, experienced experience or cancelling that artist it, it doesn't happen in Poland we can say what we say we are free to speak in Poland you are free and I am free to speak so coming back to what you said I think there is a certain level at which the majority is not should not disrespect basic dignity, human dignity, but uh, what about um, homosexual marriages? If the majority, majority should have the last say, if the majority decides that marriage is something special because it's men and women uh, having children, so it's reserved only for uh, men and women, so the majority has the right to impose that on the society. We do not take away the right of other people of living in sexual relationships. They have the right of living in those sexual relationships, but they should not have the same privileges. So I'm trying to find some way to understand my, with you. So I think it can be can coexist, but the minorities should not reduce the political um, meaning of the majority into uh, reduce it to some meaningless procedures. Manic. Manic. Could, could I just come in on that? Is that is that okay? Because yeah, I, th yeah, I think the, 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 the point on how you um, create community and, and, and the benefits of community obviously is, is, is quite important. I don't know if I quite agree with uh, the point from the audience that the problem here is is things like social media, and that's that's at the root of fragmentation. I think there's no doubt that that amplifies some of the, uh, you know, the more um, uh, fragmentary uh, disputes that go on within the world of I I identity, but I don't think it's responsible in and of itself. And I think just to try and give a little example of how this works, if you go to the uh, website of the Museum of Modern Art in, in uh, New York, and it has an, an entire section on art and identity, which is quite interesting when you when when you read it through. And it makes the point about the 1960s that uh, when feminists started to um, become involved in the art world and to make their presence felt, then right at the very start, it was very much about uh, women feeling excluded from the world of art and trying to make their voices heard and trying to gain some some level of recognition because that was the practical reality it was that many in in many walks of life women were excluded from playing a full part and the initial sort of radical feminist movements tried to address that through getting uh, a voice for women artists but very quickly it became 
uh, a, an, an argument between different groups of women because some women started to accuse other women of enjoying white privilege and getting their voice more heard than other voices. And so you started to have this um, conflict uh, between feminists who were trying to, to be involved in the art world. And you can just see that the way that identity politics has this sort of fragmentary dynamic within it where you create a hierarchy of whose voice should be most heard because you've got to prove that you're more oppressed than the other person and therefore your voice deserves to be heard in 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 in, in bef before the others and before you know it you have all these groups who and especially in a world of art where you're trying to get grants and you're trying to access money from various different organizations and you end up having to plead for a grant on the basis that you're more oppressed than another group, which means that you you have a, a, a kind of inbuilt um, need to police the boundary of your culture because your culture is, is oppressed. You don't want anybody criticizing it and you have to prove that uh, in order to get the grant that you're uh, more deserving than the other group of women who are, are, are the accusation is are, are more privileged. And so you just have this inbuilt within the identity world, uh, a tendency to more and more fragment into smaller groups and for each to argue against each other. And yes, social media comes along and it amplifies those disagreements but at the root it's it's not the root cause of them thank you Alistair. um i'd like to open out to the audience uh, but uh, only people who haven't spoken yet uh good evening everyone i'm happy to be here and first of all let's go down a bit and switch the topic so yeah, uh, so uh, my question speak. is, uh, could it be that the root of uh, all these issues with the woke culture and its restrictions on, on, on the freedom of speech be the actions of the people from the scientific field uh, related to identity politics? So let me explain a bit. For example, uh, someone decides that he wants to get a, a degree, for example, in critical race theory or gender studies. So he goes to university, he graduates, and then he finds out that he's basically useless. So he has no influence, he has no uh, job, he has no power. And so he has, or she has, they have the, uh, either two options. Either them uh, are just like fuel the status quo, or they change it, they, they infiltrate the institutions, they infiltrate the media, they push their narrative that their ideas are important and that we need to create some rules and some restrictions because the rules and restrictions are what uh, gives people the power. So they do such thing and then it's the new, like the new narrative, the new discourse, the new meta and so it's now a trend and more and more people uh, go to such, uh, get such degrees and also they have an option, either they fuel the narrative or uh, they protest it. But if they protest it, uh, they are left behind. Again, they are forgotten. So it's kind of a loop, it's like a trap. So either they impose more and more rules and restrictions or they are being left aside. So maybe that's the issue. Yeah, very good points. Any other questions? Um, next to you. Can yes. I just make a comment in here? Um, I, I just find that, that everybody's going about minority. Now, I am minority. I'm born, brought up in Aden in Yemen. I live in London, and England is not racist. England gave me a home, gave me the security, gave me opportunity, and gave me the to become the artist I am. And I have to say, you know, you're talking about minority and have no voice. Actually, when minority talks, you got other people silenced because we not we th there there is a lot of things is beautiful in my culture, but there's a lot of things that's not good. You know, I run away from forced marriage. I'm a lot of my experience about how the culture as a woman as a young girl been treated. So as an artist, I like to, and I have a right to express it and to actually say my own experience, but then I get silence for the same people who would like to give opportunity to other minority, but it doesn't think fit in their own narrative way. Now this image, um, 
actually, the, the dagger is my father, and the, and the abayas is my sister-in-laws and my sisters. So for me, it's how, as a woman grown up, and how I see the restriction in me. And that got me a death sentence, and a lot of galleries would not. So the only people actually gave me this opportunity is passion for freedom. I would not be here. I would not have the courage to carry on as an artist. And in the art world, there should be no if and but. It's, it's like it's madness now. It's like being telling the truth is becoming criminal. Uh, and uh, everybody's getting offended. Life always going to things happen. You will be offended. Get on over it. But you cannot silence. And I think the more we have an open dialogue, the more we actually understand that would be better. But to canceling somebody, to dismissing somebody, uh, it, no, the society is not going to work. We, it's it's going to be more dividing. And you have to ask yourself, who's benefiting that we are divided? Who's benefiting? Yeah. Thank you. And we, yeah, you're right. We must never okay. ignore that there is so dissent within minority groups. The problem groups. is in I'm Polish law, in opposition to our Western Europe countries, we never had law against punishing for homosexuality. We never put them in a concentration camp. We never poisoned them. We never put them in the prison like you did. Okay? And then you make opposite. Now you make uh, that nobody can have a own opinion. So it's your problem. It's not ours. Okay? And Mr. Uh, Wilstein, I respect him, but he's not a god. I'm sorry. And he's not a prophet. But he has a right to have his opinion. And the lady, she's here. She said, I have right to have opinion, I have to respect me. Yeah, to what degree? In Polish constitution, we say that all parties, everything is possible. It's uh, uh, allowed to uh, uh, be present, except fascist, nas national com uh, socialists, and communists, because we have this unique experience you don't have. And then the same in Polish constitution, made by liberal left wing parties, we have the definition of uh, families, men and women. So we tolerate. Min uh, sexual minorities or dysfunction, whatever, but we don't promote them. And this is the point. We don't punish for being homosexual. We don't punish for being normal like in West Euro uh, societies is now, it's a joke. But also we don't promote it and we say, you can do what you want, but you have no right to ab adopt, adopt children. This is the difference, yeah? Who, who is profiting? Very simple. Why they do these things? Why they take a very uh, good values like freedom, I turn it into the opposite, like a liberalism, extremism, like intolerance, like why, why they take women's rights and turn it into the hatred, like today's extreme feminism. It's two things, it's power and it's money. Power to make people ashamed, to put people in a corner, to be uh, excusing that you have your own opinion, which is not main. Like what's wrong with, with, with having a good uh, nature around? Nothing, but then you make ecologism, which is like extreme, Oh, you shouldn't do this, and you shouldn't use a straw because you know you're fascist, yeah? So, madam, if you want that minorities would rule, like you did, this is fascism. This is definition of fascism. When the, when, this is homo-fascism, this is feminism, this is liberal fascism. If you want, you want this one, this is the difference. This is the difference that the minority have right to uh, say what they say, but they have no right to rule what happens today. This is fascism. Thank you. I, I, I was, well, I, I, I was just going to just, you know, categorically state, you know, that that um, uh, I'm not anti anything, anti anti gay, um, uh, you know, marriage is uh, legal, uh, gay marriage is legal in the UK. Uh, there was a government consultation on self ID, uh, which was changing the definition of the Gender Recognition um, Act. And that's why women started talking about the repercussions. It wasn't anti-trans, it was that if any male could just self-ID as a, a, and say that they were a woman, then what happened to certain safeguards? So it was a government consultation and that's where, and, and that's where this sort of debate in the UK uh, came. It wasn't anti, it was about looking at the unintended consequences. Um, I like to think about Virginia Woolf who, who said that um, freedom is something that must be practiced you don't automatically understand freedom. You need to practice it and practice it daily. Um, as a writer, she did. And I think that as artists, we try and do that. And it makes us incredibly vulnerable, incredibly vulnerable. So I've worked with the military um, and uh, I was speaking to somebody who had been in the Secret Service. And I asked, like, why is it that artists are the first to get targeted? And he actually laughed at me. And he said, of course, it's artists that get 
targeted first. You're the difficult ones. You're the challenging ones. You won't blink. You'll keep looking. You'll keep saying. You'll keep speaking out. You're a threat. You're a threat to anybody that wants to control people. He said, the funny thing is at the moment, I mean, he said, you are the canaries in the coal mine. The funny thing is, in the, in, in the Secret Service, they actually use it as a barometer, a measurement, an actual cultural measurement, and they look around different societies. The first people to be targeted are artists, and it flags up that this is not a healthy and this is not a tolerant society, and they use it to predict that there may be unrest coming or it's the coming in of authoritarian regimes. He said, the thing is, Rosie, you're just not used to feeling it in the West. Thank you. We have um, 12 more minutes. Um, so if there are any more questions from the panel, uh, so if one can try and be a bit succinct, uh, and maybe pose a question uh, you know, that might provoke us and uh, all the rest of the audience members. No? Okay, I'm going to pass it back to the panel then. Um, I mean, I, I, I just uh, uh, going to break my kind of impartial chair chairpersonship. Um, homosexuality, I only found out two months ago, was legalized in Poland in 1935. You know, so uh, it's you know that's what I read. I might be wrong. Um, uh, so it, it, I think the the, the question of um, equality and um, uh, personal sexual choice and preferences is by and large in the Western democratic world is uh, uh, accepted. Um, what I think uh, is happening is the, um, the problem of, um, you know, the, of when the minority becomes dominant majority voices, but there's no unification on that. Um, uh, and I do think that's, that's a problem. Um, so if we kind of think about you know, religion, religion obviously binds a lot of people together, but it should also be tolerant to other um, um, uh, uh, positions and ways of life and um, uh, and and uh, personal choices um, but it should those personal choices influence the change of Christianity or the change of uh, uh, Islam or something like that you know that's a question I'd like to just pose uh, getting back on to uh, the panel um, anyone else all right one more question thank you uh, so one more question from me. Uh, maybe it's my personal experience, but from what I've seen around the world, it's usually very hard to maintain the balance between, let's say, the conservatives and the liberal left. So either one of them uh, comes to power and uh, tries to silence the other one. So for example, like if we have the liberal left in power, and they always say that they like for the freedom of speech, so all uh, every person could uh, like uh, have a voice in their society. But then they begin to silence those who they don't like. For example, they they, they label them as a Nazi, like you're a Nazi, so your opinion doesn't count. We need to silence you. We need to shut down, for example, your art exhibit or something like this. But the same can happen like in in country like China, where the auto auto. Uh, Authoritarian, yes, government uh, silenced the Muslims, for example, and uh, destroyed. Communist. This yes, is this call the themselves communist. They believe in communism, etc. Yeah, but, but they, they are they are communists, but they have like more like conservative way of life. They forbid the homo the <laughs> Yeah, but like they forbid the LGBTQ plus, as I know, the Muslims, all stuff yeah, like this. Yeah, so like, it, but it's the conservatives. If you care about the uh, LGBTQ regime and the right of uh, transgender, that, why don't you fight for those people on both sides because they're getting, those countries are getting killed. Not in Russia. Yeah, be because, no, but uh, well, okay. they are also a conservative country. They're, uh, oh, if, um, if I. Sorry. Yes, but the religion is the uh, conservative part. There. Excuse me, um, the, the translators, because there's a yeah, there's a, a debate between you two, but it needs the to be more they are Sharia law. Out. So if you, uh, this is what I find it, it drive me crazy. I mean, look, I I born in Yemen, grew up in there. I, I lived under communism, dictatorship, and Sharia law. I escaped. 
um, when the Sharia law comes. Um, and, and then I find it is, in the Western world, they're always moaning and always saying, oh, gay rights, lesbian light, uh, LGBT. But the country, in the Western world, you, did, you, you don't stone them. They all have all the rights. In the uh, countries, in Islamic country, in Iran, in Arabic, in Africa, they actually kill them. Why didn't people fight for they and for those countries? Because I tell you what, it's not politically correct. It's not like giving you the blue. It's, it's becoming, it's like a fashion. Uh, look, I'm standing for certain people just to look uh, kind of good in front of other people. I think, look, I, I, in my opinion, do whatever you like. Everybody have a right to live and love and to be what they want. Just don't impose it. Same thing with religion. You can practice whatever you want. Don't impose it to others. Simple. Uh, yeah, um, so I completely agree with you on the part that everyone should have a voice and uh, live the way they want. But like the point is that no matter who comes into power, someone very Christian or very um, Islamic and religious or someone very left and like modern and progressive, Either way, they come into power and try to silence the opposites. So, like, we need to, for the society to be healthy, we need to maintain the balance. But in every country, there is uh, a shift, like, either on the right side or on the left side. It's not much countries left in the world, not many countries left in the world, like Poland, where both sides can have a voice. Usually, you're being cancelled either by the lefts or by the rights and you have no voice. For example, if you live in uh, the United States and you have very uh, right-wing views, you are being silenced. If you live, for example, I don't know, in Russia and you have very left-wing views, you are also being silenced by the government that is pro-religious and pro-Christian. So like... Uh, uh, um, sorry, uh, we, we, we probably need to the move be, on The now. best solution Chance is people need to wake up and stand up and get, kick the, those politicians out until people actually realize that we need to get involved and wake up and see the people okay. who's dividing mm -hmm. us, they need to go. So okay, thank you. Thank you, Tessley. And so that was a good exchange. Um, now we're going to ask our panel to uh, uh, respond. We have about six minutes, so we'll kind of... Uh, um, get everyone to make some comments. Two minutes each, uh, summing up and uh, of, of the thoughts. So we'll start with uh, Agnieszka. Uh, first of all, I'm really happy that so many people came and that there was so much engagement from the from the public. I think it's uh, one of the liveliest conversations it's we nice had so nice. far. And I, and I love the fact that there were opposing views and everyone tried to keep their calm and express themselves, so I, I, I would really applaud the, the audience for joining in. Yeah. And I think this is how it should be, that people can, 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 can speak out, they can talk, they, they try to stay civil, even if the emotions try to take over. Um, so thank you for being such a great audience today, it's amazing. I second that, yes. It's, it's very hard to chair, though. Yeah. <laughs> but it's wonderful, yeah, I love the spirit here. Um, yeah, Tuko, uh, let me just um, um, a couple of sentences. Um, we live in a reality in which it's obligatory uh, to put everything on, um, let's say, as equal, but things are different. So, for instance, if you say that, oh, the, the, the left uh, tries to silence the right and the right tries to silence the left. And uh, where is the right? Maybe in China. Well, I think the, um, the Chinese communists uh, uh, wouldn't believe that they can be classified as rightist. Uh, um, an ex-KGB officer as a representative of a church regime, I, I think, uh, wouldn't believe that uh, Mr. Putin wouldn't believe that he's he's being called like this. Well, the world is diverse, and uh, every um, idea um, can be interpreted in a wrong way, and uh, every religion um, might be interpreted in a wrong way. And of course, we can discuss if a religion calls on loving the enemy or killing the enemy. Uh, does your religion require you to kill or to love your enemy? And these are fundamental differences. It's not true that everyone is the same and uh, when they get to power, they will do the same. No. Dziękuję bardzo. Any final thoughts? 
I, I think I just uh, just to second Agnieszka and just to say um, that it's it's really I think we need to be open <laughs> to debate, <laughs> and that's actually proving to be quite hard. Um, and finding you know like like spending time to think for yourself and to work things out for yourself. <laughs> Uh, is really important and to test these ideas. One can only test these ideas by speaking. And so that's the really big nasty um, problem with censorship is that nobody gets a chance to kind of figure out these ideas and push them further. And these are really important things. This is about uh, identity is important to us. History is important to us. Culture is important to us. Um, and I do honestly believe, I think the politicians are getting away with it by having so much divide and rule going on. And so I think constantly looking looking up, looking at uh, who, who benefits, like who benefits, always, always be thinking of that rather than the punching down, punching up and, 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 and sort of killing each other. We need, we need to be constantly looking at the bigger power structure. Thanks, and final words, Alistair, before I sum up and close the meeting. Um, well, I'm not sure I, sh I completely caught the final exchanges there and understood them, but it was nice to see people arguing in, 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 in many ways, because I think one of the things that identity politics does is it splits everyone up and puts everybody into their own different box. And so people shout from their box to someone else's box, but never actually uh, or very often don't meet in, in the same space to be able to discuss anything. And I think you know, looking at the discussion tonight, then people have different opinions and quite radically different opinions listening to some of the discussion. But the fact that people are sitting in a room, putting in a very uh, forthright way, yes, but nevertheless putting their different opinions to other people and having a bit of a discussion about it seems to me to be um, an incredibly good thing because it removes people from their individualized boxes and, and brings people into a common space. And that that seems to me to be the the the, the way forward. I mean, I just think to, to kind of bring it back to art uh, uh, to, to, to finish with, because it does strike, it just seems to me that the identitarian uh, influence within the art world is just hugely problematic. And, and um, in many ways, I just think uh, uh, the, uh, the bottom line of it is that, that we need to regain the confidence to speak about art as a, a, as a discipline and a subject in and of itself, freed from the sort of political boundaries that go with it because one of the biggest problems just now is that you can rarely have a discussion around the art itself it's always uh, got this politics and the need to take a political position and your voice not being heard unless you have a certain political position that always seems to me to get in the way of the art itself so if we can um, have the confidence to say uh, we can think about and judge art as individuals freed from all the baggage, political baggage that we carry around with us, then that would be actually quite a good thing to reclaim that space for art. Thank you. Um, it's nine o'clock, so we're going to uh, wrap up. Um, I just want to say thank you to the speakers um, and also you, the audience, for being so um, so lively, which is great. And uh, we really need to, like Alistair summed up, you know, being in a room in real life, talking and discussing, even arguing, but then hopefully sharing bread and having a glass of wine together or something. Um, so thank you, the audience. Thank you, the wonderful speakers. Thank you for the translators. Uh, you've done a tremendous job. Uh, <laughs> very, very, a, a very challenging one, but you did wonderfully. I, uh, it was great uh, to hear uh, the Polish speakers um, and to hear them so uh, uh, eloquently passionately and articulately. Um, I also want to thank the technicians again. Uh, uh, they've done a fantastic job in putting this together, making sure everything runs smoothly uh, with the, 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 the virtual uh, uh, presence as well as our physical presence. So please, a, a round of applause to uh, the technical team. And, and finally, uh, the, the Jostowski uh, Castle Center for Contemporary Art. Um, Anka, who's the produ uh, production coordinator, helped us get come here and to hotels and so forth. Uh, 
uh, things from uh, looked after us. So please, uh, a thank you to Anka. And uh, also the directors of the museum, I think uh, uh, they've been very brave in, in adding to the museum's um, values of tolerance and differences of opinions, differences of aesthetics, uh, differences of uh, how one interprets arts, and as Alistair said, you know, different narratives in arts. So I think that's very brave, it's very rare. So I'd like to thank uh, uh, the directors of the museum and um, uh, to end here, and may they go forth and having greater plurality and diversity of art in this uh, amazing uh, art center. So good night, and I hope you uh, will all come to the next uh, discussion which is um, moving on, really. I suppose some, Alistair touched on some of it, but you know, postmodernism is uh, something that kind of permeates contemporary art and culture. So we're going to try and unravel that a bit more. Um, there's some positive things about postmodernism. There's probably some problematic things. So come again and argue and uh, put, your, put forward your thoughts. Uh, that's on the 27th of November, 24th of November, so uh, two months' time. Anything else, uh, Aniska? Thank you so much and good night.